Hi there, I'm Sally, he's Miles, and this is Harife. Follow us in these next few videos as we're sailing around the magnificent coastline of the west of Scotland. We'll show you some of the many ancient castles we found that are surrounded by some of Scotland's most stunning mountain scenery. You'll see how we got the rare opportunity to spot a humpback whale, along with loads of these, some of these, and plenty of these. I'm going to give you a glimpse of how we approach navigating and sailing in our boat in all kinds of conditions and we'll show you some of our favourite spots we found to anchor alongside the beautiful beaches and remote islands of the Outer Hebrides. From time spent exploring coastal waterfalls and geologically fascinating sea caves to just simply enjoying the moment, we'll hope that you'll be able to see what an amazing and varied country Scotland is to sail around. We're starting this journey off from within the Firth of Clyde, where the coast is easily accessible and less than an hour's drive from the centre of Glasgow. We've been enjoying some unseasonably warm but unfortunately windless conditions, and we're currently waiting for a weather window before making our way around the Mullican Tyre and further up the Scottish west coast. Herife is currently anchored here off a small island of Little Cumbria, where we're going to go ashore and take a walk over to the back of the island. Despite it being so close to the mainland, Little Cumbria is one of the least visited islands in the area and it's only in the last few years that the public have had the right to visit. Even so, there's no ferry or actual dock as such, so access is limited to private boats or small day trippers from the mainland. Due to it being relatively unfrequented and its craggy coastline, it's home to a huge amount of gulls and other birds. The cliffs on the south side of the island are reportedly home to a few pairs of golden eagles. But today we're here to check out the abandoned lighthouse and the surrounding buildings on the west side of the island. The original lighthouse on this site was built in 1793, but as you can see there's been several updates over the years, up until the whole site was abandoned around 25 years ago. The large house and outbuildings adjacent to the lighthouse look as though there have been some renovation work done more recently, but the whole place is just left wide open and it looks like a set out of a cheap horror movie. These are the two big diesel generators that had been used to power the lighthouse and the rest of the site on this side of the island. And they still look in pretty good condition. I reckon with a can of WD-40 and a couple of spanners I could get these bad boys up and running again in no time. As you can see, we're back on the boat and using the little bit of wind we have for a very short journey over to a little anchorage just off the southeast coast of the Isle of Butte. This is Glen Callum Bay, a beautiful little spot overlooking the mountains on the Isle of Arran. Although it's exposed to the south, which can mean it's subject to the usual southerly swell that occurs here in the Clyde, on a day like this, it's nothing we need to worry about and it's a good base to walk and check out the southern side of the Isle of Butte. I promise we're not going to descend into sightseeing Wikipedia quoting types of video but I just wanted to quickly show you this as it's quite a cool site due to its age and it's in a beautiful spot. It's St Blaine's Church or what remains of it and there's been a church on this site for over 1600 years. 
The oldest part of the building at the back here is built on the remains of that earliest structure. Then most of the rest of it dates back to 790 AD. We're back out in the Clyde making our way over to the Isle of Arran in very light wind and barely getting any headway but these calm conditions and clear visibility make it great for spotting marine wildlife and it looks as though Sally's just seen something off the bow. It's quite far away from me, aren't you? I don't know what it's doing. This is quite a rare sighting of a humpback whale here in the Firth of Clyde. There hasn't been one spotted in the area for over eight years, so we're incredibly lucky to get to oh, see going, this. Going, going. It's moving. Oh wow, he's massive. Humpbacks are usually identified by the unique markings on the underside of the tails, also known as the fluke. This one hadn't been logged in Scottish waters before, but it's now been registered and given a unique ID number. The whale stayed in the area for a couple of hours, and we just drifted along keeping our distance and watching for when it surfaced. Having never seen a humpback before, it was a pretty special experience, and other than a distant fishing boat for a short while, we were the only ones out there to witness it. There is a bit of an unfortunate ending to this story. A few days after this, the same whale was spotted in one of the locks a little further north, and a group of jet bikers were seen riding dangerously close and harassing it. Sadly, the police were eventually contacted and asked to intervene. Well, we're continuing to make the most of the weather, and we've headed over towards the Isle of Arran, and we're now anchored just off Holy Isle. Holy Isle lies just off the east coast of Arran and we're going to be waiting here for the next few days until that wind finally starts to fill in. The island's currently privately owned and ran as a Buddhist spiritual retreat and it has a history as a holy sanctuary in one form or another dating back to the 6th century. There's quite a lot of these sheep, along with goats and horses roaming wild around the place. But as the island's only quite small, then the gene pool for these animals to breed from is also naturally small. And unfortunately, some of them do appear to have issues that are probably caused by this.
Even though the sun's out and the weather for relaxing today is glorious, the forecast shows that the good stuff for sailing is on its way back here. And so we stretch our legs for one last time and take in the view from the top of the island before heading back to the boat to do a little passage planning for tomorrow's rounding of the Mull of Kintyre. So, we're finally off. Leaving the anchorage at Holy Hour, we have a south-southwesterly wind. This means us having to sail as close to the wind as possible for the next few hours, if we want to keep our planned course. The forecast is showing that we should have good, strong winds from the southwest for the next few days. And so as long as we can avoid the rain, we should have some really good sailing. Not that the rain will mean the sailing's bad, it just means we'll get wet. I'm really looking forward to getting back up the west coast of Scotland again. There's several new spots that we have on our list to visit and weather permitting we'll try and get to see as many as possible. As we continue heading further southwest, we're aiming to get to this point here just east of the Isle of Sander for 9.20 as this coincides with the turn of the tide and slack water. This will enable us to catch the current as the water starts to ebb out the Clyde and it'll give us a push for the next several hours until we reach the Isle of Gear. There are some significant tidal currents around the islands and headlands of Scotland and if you can accurately navigate these, then these skills should enable you to be able to do the same anywhere in the world. The UK does have a small advantage for the sailor though, and that's that this information is readily available from many sources. So, we're going to show you a few that we use. First off is the Nautical Almanac, and among many other things, this covers tide tables, second report information, and for areas where the currents are significant, it provides tidal stream information for each hour before and after high water. There's also some descriptive passage planning information that can help you decide when and where to avoid. Then we've got the local cruising guides. This one's written by the Clyde Cruising Club and printed by Imray. They have five guides that cover the west coast of Scotland, Orkney and Shetland. Again, it covers tidal currents for a given area, but usually this will have a more in-depth description of passage expectations. Then we've got the Tidal Stream Atlas, and this solely shows the tidal currents on an hour by hour basis, and this one covers the whole of West Scotland. As with all the printed tidal current information for the UK, this uses the time of high water Dover as a date and reference for the chart, and it shows the speed and direction of the current for every hour up to six hours before and after high water Dover. This is so if you travel from one area to another and need to use more than one chart, then there's no confusing local port conversion necessary you just need to know what time high water Dover is that day. Then, as most people do, if you navigate using a chart plotter, tablet or laptop, in most cases this tidal current information is also available within the menu selection. I rarely passage plan for the currents using electronic navigation if I can help it, as I find that the spacing of the current indicators on the charts are usually very far apart, and if you need to accurately calculate current speed and direction changes when planning anything other than a very short journey, it can become very tiresome. And let's not forget, good old paper charts. All of these will show you the tidal stream information based on the tidal diamonds. These are fixed points located on the chart and the referenced on the table showing the speed and direction of the current at that location. Again, all based on the time of high water Dover. One advantage of passage planning on paper charts is that they clearly show you any predicted areas of potentially dangerous water where there might be overfalls or eddies. These are shown on the chart plotter, but the way vector charts work means that if you're not zoomed right in they can easily be missed, and up here in Scotland, and specifically in this case here around the headland of the Mull of Kintyre, they can be significant. These overfalls are caused by an increase in volume and speed of the sea, pushing around the headland which causes the water to become turbulent, depending on whether it's close to a springs or a neaps tide, and factoring in the direction and strength of the wind. This increased turbulence can cause steep breaking waves and become potentially dangerous, but with a little bit of planning, any problems should be easily avoided. In both instances where the tide is ebbing west and north, and where it's flooding south and east, in anything other than in calm conditions close to a neaps tide, there's an area here that we want to try and avoid. And so here, we basically have two options on how we can approach sailing past the Mullock Tire. There's an inside or an outside route we can take. 
We've made this journey quite a few times and we stick to our general rule for passing all islands and headlands and that is if the land is windward and we're being blown away from the shore we'll usually sail close to the shore or in this case we'll choose the inside route and if it's leeward and we're getting blown towards the shore we'll keep a safe distance from land or here go on the outside. So on this route we can see on the chart and we know from experience that the overfalls can come very close to the shoreline on the southwest corner. This can mean that if you choose that inside route you may need to sail as close as 50 metres from the rocky shoreline to avoid them. Even with a favourable wind direction or otherwise relatively calm conditions, a large swell coming off the Atlantic can make this a daunting and potentially dangerous experience. Now, every route, boat and sailor is different, so you need to carefully balance these factors and the weather conditions when making a decision. As we said earlier, today we have south south westerly wind, so that's why we've decided to choose to take the outside route. The wind's starting to pick up a bit, and as you can see the boat's heeled over more and the tow rail's in the water. Sally's just been below deck for the last 20 minutes trying to fix a camera mount that I broke, and the lumpy conditions have unfortunately made her feel a bit seasick. How are you feeling Sam? As we need to keep the crew happy and I don't want a mutiny on our hands I'm going to put a reef into the mainsail and see if we can smooth things out a little. That broken camera mount that Sally was trying to fix was so I could record and still use two hands to do stuff but as I can't use it I'll have to use this as practice of how to reef the mainsail single handed. Do you get it? Single handed? Sorry. That was bad, that was bad. So that's done, we've now got less sail out, we're not as overpowered and the boat's a little bit more upright. Things feel a little bit less lumpy and as usual we've not slowed down any. Now that's the boat sorted, I'd better attend to the crew, so it's time for a cup of tea. So we decided to show you this little bit of mundane boat life because we were recently talking to someone that was fascinated by how we could use the toilet or make a cup of tea while we were sailing and rolling around. Now I'm obviously not going to show you how I use the toilet as that's a little bit too niche and this video is on YouTube, not OnlyFans. But I'll recall a story I heard about a male member of crew on a boat that went down to the toilet in some choppy weather and didn't come back out for a while. His crewmate eventually went to check on him and found him on the floor of the heads, trousers around his ankles, with it all flopping around and covered in piss. He'd slipped, banged his head and knocked himself out. Now, I don't know about you, but I would never want to be remembered as that guy. So I'll just say that in that regard, everybody needs to sit down for everything. Please remember I'm holding the camera in one hand trying to film this and I'd usually not be pouring the milk in my tea like a bloody lunatic. Thank you. So we're five miles off the Isle of Sander, just about to round the Mullican Tire. We've got 20 knots gusting to 25 knots on the nose. It's a little bit choppy, but hopefully get to the back of the Isle of Sander. We can bear off, be on a little bit more of a beam reach and the uh, sea states to flatten out a little bit. We're just passing south of Sander and we've changed our course a little and are now heading west. As you can see, the changing direction now means the wind and waves are coming at us from the side a little more. We've been able to ease the sails out a little and the boat isn't nearly as heeled over. We've got two and a half knots of current with us already and we've even got some patches of blue sky in front. trying to be over dramatic <laughs> <laughs>
With the addition of the speed of the current, this westward heading part of the route is short lived. We're quickly approaching the corner of the headland and we'll soon be thinking about bearing away and heading north. So getting ready for this, I'm attaching our preventer line to the end of the boom. Once we start to turn and head north, the wind will then be coming from behind the boat. It'll be on our port quarter and we'll be on a deep broad reach. In the event that the wind somehow gets behind the mainsail and we get backwinded, this preventer line will effectively lock the boom in place and help stop the boat from accidentally jibing and that boom from swinging and potentially causing any damage or hitting one of us. Hang on, need to put it on wide angle. So, we've passed the southwest corner of the Mulligan Tire and we've just changed our heading and are now starting to head north. And as we let the main sheet out and the boom swings over, we tighten up the slack in the preventer and this'll help brace the boom. The wind has eased off to 18 knots now, but we're still doing 10 knot speed over ground and the conditions feel very different to when we were sailing in the opposite direction a few hours ago. Looking back behind us to the southwest, we can see the coast of Northern Ireland and the sea cliffs of Fairhead. Although directly behind us is more of the wet stuff, so we'll see if we can manage to avoid that, at least until we get to gear. One of the beauties of sailing in Scotland is how surprisingly few boats there seems to be at times. That's not to say that some areas and places aren't a little busier, but compared to the south of the UK, you certainly have a lot more space on your own. This is the first boat that we've actually seen in 10 hours. As we approach gear, the wind drops, so we furl in the sails and motor the last couple of miles into Ardmanish Bay. There are a few boats in the bay here, as it's a popular little stopover spot when heading north or south. We decide to pick up a mooring buoy for the night, and even though the sun's shining now, it's not long before that wet weather that's been chasing us for the last few hours finally catches up. Yeah. Watch the next video where we're making our way up to Oban and the Isle of Kerrera and checking out the castle before heading off north again through the Sound of Mull.